Well, hello, hello, hello. How are you guys doing? <laughs> Good? Y'all look really sweet. Who dressed up tonight? Yeah, let's go. In case you didn't know, I'm a, I'm a pet detective. And uh, none of you, just kidding, a few of you. That's good. Hey, uh, man, I am so, so stoked to be here with you guys tonight. Um, thanks for coming out to the Monster Mash. We got so much great stuff still ahead, and the night is far from over. So we're going to hang for just a bit. I'm going to share uh, just this, this message with you guys, share what God wants to speak to you tonight, and then we're going we're gonna to party, man. It's going to be really, 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 really Sweet. Anybody think they got the best costume in the house? Yeah. Cool. Well, uh, time will tell because we're having a really sweet costume contest later on tonight. And I hope you guys brought your dancing shoes. Did you? Yes. Dancing shoes? Hey. 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 Get it. Let's go. <laughs> Let's go. Hey, Halloween is next week, and uh, we decided to throw, man, hopefully the best party in town a week early. And uh, we're, we're really excited that you guys came to hang out with us. And uh, tonight is all about one name, my friends. And I'm not, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. We never do. We're going to get right into it. But tonight is all about Jesus, as every night is. And uh, tonight I want to share a message with you that I've titled King of the Grave. And we'll be looking in just a bit at 1 Corinthians Chapter 15, verses 1 through 6, if you brought a Bible, you can go ahead and turn there or Google it, bookmark it. But King of the Grave, 1 Corinthians 15, chapter, or verses 1 through 6. Hey, real quick, turn to somebody next to you and tell them that they look groovy. Turn to someone else and ask them why graveyards are always so noisy. Turn back to them and say, because of all the coffin. That was good, huh? That was good. That was good. Speaking of coughing, man, anybody else been battling that sickness going around? Yeah, it's not been fun, hey. It's not been fun. But hey, so, king of the grave, I want to share this message with you guys, and, and I pray, and I know, and I trust that tonight is going to be so incredibly insane for so many of you, and it's going to be just so revolutionary. Maybe you've heard this story time and time again, but I pray that tonight as we dig into the word, as we dig into God's word for us, that it would revolutionize our thinking and would change our lives and our eternity. Will you pray with me before we continue? Father, we come before you. And God, we just thank you so much for tonight. Thank you that we get to, to hang out every Thursday, Lord. Thank you that we get to, to dress up in fun costumes, Lord, and to dance and to worship you. And God, to have a, just a great night, Lord. We're, we're so thankful for the life that you've given us. And uh, the fact that we get to live life to the full is such an honor. So, God, we thank you so much for your great love and for doing something about it and not just speaking it, but showing us how much you love us. We pray you'd speak in Jesus' name. Amen. Today at 428 p.m., 109,700 people had already died. And that's only today. This year... Over 47 million people have already died, and that number just keeps going up and up and up. Like, wow, Cody, this is really depressing. Thank you. Well, why are you bringing this up? Well, here's why I bring this up. Because death is something that is very real and will happen to us all one day. But despite the reality of death, there is the reality of life after death. And tonight, I really want to just stress the fact that this message is simple, friend. That the message is this, is that you don't have to die, that the grave isn't your final resting place. And that Jesus is the king of the grave, and he loves you so, so, so much. I really believe that God is wanting to bring a lot of you back from the dead tonight. Anybody else believe in that with me? Yeah? Anybody like, man, God, God's going to do something tonight. And even if you're like, man... I didn't know I was dead, bro. Like, it's true. Maybe you're more, <laughs> have you ever seen Princess Bride, right? Mostly dead. Mostly dead, right? Was that good? That was pretty good. <laughs> it's because I'm sick, man. I can do it. But uh, some of you may not think or some of you may not know that, that you're dead. 
in your sins, that you're, you're bogged down, that your life is being drained from you, that the potential that you have is really being sucked out of your life. As Christians, we never graduate past the gospel. We never graduate past the gospel. It's always been about Jesus, and it's always going to continue to be about Jesus. That's it. That's why we come here every week. We never graduate past the gospel. It's not like this new thing of like, yo, check this out. It's like, no, man, it's always Jesus. It's always been about Jesus, and it always will be. I'm sure that you've heard many times that Jesus loves you and that he died for you. Anybody heard that before? Yeah? I think a lot of us have heard that, that Jesus loves us and died for us. And while that's so true and so beautiful and so profound, so often we forget the reality of the resurrection. So often we forget that Jesus didn't just die, but that he rose again from the dead. And tonight I want to kind of dig at that and give you guys hopefully some, some sound evidence, some, some good uh, arguments for why Jesus rose. And then we're going to get in, into our, our scripture passage in just a minute. But if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, my friends, then all of this is a lie. If he didn't rise from the dead, then none of this is real. That we just come here and we just sing songs to some dead guy who died 2,000 years ago. And, you know, we, we say our lives are different, but are they really? See, if Jesus didn't die, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then this is all a lie. I've heard it said that Jesus is either a liar, a lunatic, or Lord. That he's either a liar, that he lied about everything. He claimed to be God so many times in the New Testament. You can go check it out yourself. Either he's a liar and he lied about it all. Either he's crazy, which is kind of crazy to think because if you look at his teachings and his life, they're the most complex, most detailed, most profound in the history of forever because Jesus claimed to be God and he actually is God. So he's either a liar, a lunatic, or he's God, my friends. Either he's God, and it's one of those three. If Jesus is God, then everything he said was true. If Jesus rose from the dead, then everything is true. You get what I'm saying? If Jesus rose from the dead, then everything is true. Did you know that there were 400 prophecies that were written about Jesus in the Old Testament? Say that with me, 400. 400. Not 40, not four. 400 prophecies. And did you know that Jesus fulfilled every single one of those prophecies? Every single one. How could this be if he wasn't God? One of the prophecies even said that he would be born in a specific town called Bethlehem. And in Micah 5.2, which was written, check this out. This verse was written, was prophesied about the coming Messiah. This was written 700 years before, about 700 years before Jesus came to earth. And Micah 5.2 says this, but you, Bethlehem, David's country, the runt of the litter, from you will come the leader who will shepherd rule Israel. He'll be no upstart, no pretender. You can't pick where you're born, can you? I didn't pick, y'all, I'd really like Australia. I'd really like to be born there. I didn't say that. None of us picked where we were born. Some of you were born here in Albuquerque. And you're like, oh, Albuquerque. But you're here for a reason, friend. We're going to change this city. It's already being changed, amen? Yeah? I love it. It's a city worth saving. I really believe that based on looking at the Bible, based on looking at Scripture and historical resources, that Jesus is who he says he is. And the fact that he fulfilled all 400 detailed prophecies about him before he even came to this earth speaks volumes. That's just one thing, man. There's so much as well. But I really believe, friend, that, that you're all here for a reason. Whether you're born in Albuquerque, you're born in Australia, in Colorado, in Phoenix, California, Utah, like wherever you've been born, you're here for a reason. God has brought you here for a reason. And these truths that we're hearing tonight will not only change your life here on earth, but will change your eternity. Jesus loves you so much. Never forget that. Jesus loves you so much. And he died for you. But he didn't just die for you. He rose again from the dead for you. 
that he rose again, friend. And many of you are here tonight. Many of you are listening. Maybe many of you believe in and follow Jesus. Maybe you've even got a t-shirt that says, Jesus is my homeboy, right? <laughs> Maybe you've got that, uh, you know, like the really glittery, glittery Bible and, you know, all these tabs. And it's great. And, you know, you love Jesus. You follow him. And, and you love him. And he's, he's your homeboy. He's your God. He's your Savior. Many of you may follow Jesus. Many, many of you may know Jesus. But even though some may know Jesus and are following Jesus, some may still be wrestling with their faith. I know I was there, friend. I don't ever want to pretend. I don't want us to ever pretend that, you know, I come to Spectrum and I got to look really good and know everything. It's like, you don't have to know everything, friend. I don't know everything. We're learning this together, man. We're here following an infinite God who's given us his tangible word as a revelation to us, as guidelines for us, as a love letter to us about the past, the present, and the future. So I just want to say, if you're here tonight and you're wrestling, you know, you know God, you're like, yeah, I know he, he died, and, you know, like, it's great, and I come, but I'm still, did, did he really rise from the dead? Did, did he really come to earth? Is he really, did he even really exist? Was he a real person? Did he rise again? What about other religions? Who is the real Jesus? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> Keep asking, my friend. Keep seeking. Because if you do, you will find answers and you will find the real Jesus. If you keep digging, you keep seeking. Start with the Bible and dig and pray and ask pastors and, and ask the Holy Spirit. He's the greatest shepherd of all. Because God wants to show you something. He wants to step into your life. The Bible says that he stands at the door and he knocks. He says, whoever opens the door... I will come in and I will have dinner with them. I will fellowship with them. I will come in and be the Lord of their lives. So as we continue tonight, I pray that these answers, these facts, this evidence helps us see that Jesus really is God and is really alive today. So before we get into 1 Corinthians 15, we're getting there. You're like, Cody, where are you going? I want to just share these three quick things with you guys. You guys can write these down. There are three... Uh, claims three things about Jesus and his, uh, his deity and his resurrection that I hope can be a tool to you guys, that I hope can be a tool to your friends. The first thing is that Jesus is a real historical figure. Jesus died in about A.D. 33. Some scholars say maybe 30 A.D., but he died for sure between 30 A.D. and 33 A.D. The latter, biblical scholars will say, A.D. 33. So we'll go with that. So he died in A.D. 33. It's interesting because the religion of Islam, who was founded by this guy named Muhammad, he was born at 570 A.D. So this guy was born over 500 years after Jesus, after Jesus was born, after Jesus had died. So I just want to bring this up. To say that from a historical perspective, friend, it makes no sense for us to believe the account of a man who didn't even live at the time of Jesus explain who Jesus was apart and aside from the people who actually lived with Jesus 500 years before. You get what I'm saying? So if this guy Muhammad is telling all this stuff about Jesus, why, why would we believe from a historical perspective what this man is saying 500 years after Jesus was born after he died and rose again. So I want to just bring it back to this. Even the New Testament Jewish and Roman historians who are not Christians all confirm the incredible core details of the Jesus who died and the Christian belief of him rising from the dead and being fully God. Even people who weren't following Jesus still acknowledge the fact that Jesus claimed to be God and that the Christian faith hinges on the resurrection of him. And I pray that you guys are sticking with me, man. We're getting through this. I wasn't the best in history, so I'm like, oh, gosh, this is hard. But it's important for us to talk about this stuff, to get some tools, and to really continue to dig in the Bible. One of my good pastor homies said this. I love this. Check it out. 
He said, New Testament manuscripts are ancient documents with historical data. If you refuse to look at them simply because they contain accounts of miracles, you are not a historian. You are a philosopher with a bias. <laughs> I love that. Because believe it or not, whether you want to believe it or not, whether your college professors down the road or your parents or your friends or your uncle who think he knows everything, whether he's saying, they're saying that the Bible isn't reliable. We need to know that the Bible is the most reliable, the most authentic, the most preserved documentation in all of history. If you don't believe me, check this out. So the Greek poet named Homer, who wrote the Odyssey and the Iliad and some other stuff, which I had to read in sixth grade. It was kind of cool, but it's, it's all fake stuff. But uh, his manuscripts, we only have 643 manuscripts of his works. Okay, we only have 90 manuscripts of the life of the Roman emperor Julius Caesar and only seven manuscripts of the philosopher Plato's dialogues. But guess how many manuscripts we have of the New Testament? Any guesses? 40. Over a 1,000. It's good. It's close. We have 5,805 manuscripts of the New Testament that are written in the original language of Greek. Did you know that there are over 25,000 manuscripts that are translated in, in different languages? People today can read Greek. If you read Greek, you're a legend. If you want to, do it. But you can go. You can read these manuscripts. You can read for yourself and see that every single one of these 5,805 manuscripts all talk about the risen Christ. They all talk about Jesus, friend. They're all the same. The Bible is the most preserved, the most translated book in all of history. Tell me that God isn't behind that. Tell me that all these years later, God doesn't want us to read and to know. Tell me why the Bible has been preserved. If it's just another book, then why hasn't it died off? Why is it the most bought, the most talked about? Why is Jesus the most hated in all of history? Why don't people put down Muhammad? Why don't they put down Allah? Why don't they put down the, the, the Mormon faith? Why don't they, you get what I'm saying? Why are Christians always picked on? It's because Jesus is real. And the devil hates us. And that's it, friends. If, if the devil can come in and get you to believe a lie that Jesus isn't real, that he isn't risen, then he can take away your eternal relationship with God. So I pray tonight that as we dig, as we look, that you see that Jesus, as he claimed, is the only way, the only truth, the only life, that whoever wants to get to the Father has to go through him. The Bible is the most preserved, most translated book in all of history. Don't forget that. So Jesus claimed to be God is the second thing. First thing, Jesus was an actual, real, historical figure. Number two, Jesus claimed to be God. The Bible clearly says many times in the New Testament that Jesus is God. He says in John 10.30 that he and the Father are one. In John 8, 58 through 59, Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Then they took up stones to throw at him. That name, I am, is one of God's most personal names. Y-H-V-H, Y-H-W-H, the Tetragrammaton, yod heh vav heh the four Hebrew letters. This is the name that God gives Moses at the burning bush. He says, I am who I am. Here Jesus is saying, I am. I am the one that appeared to, to, the, to the bush with Moses. I am the one who created the heavens and the earth. I am. Jesus said before Abraham was, I am. Jesus claimed to be God over and over again. In Exodus 3.14, talks about uh, this encounter that Moses had with God. And Jesus is claiming to be the eternal God that, that not only appeared to Moses, but to Abraham and to all of the fathers that came before us. This is why these religious leaders picked up stones. They wanted to crucify him, to kill him, because they knew that Jesus claimed to be God. I want to share these few quick thoughts and we'll move on. Cool? You still with me? Still with me? Cool, cool. In Matthew 12, 8, Jesus says, The Son of Man is even Lord of the Sabbath. Here Jesus is claiming to be the God of Genesis 1. In the beginning, God made the heavens and the earth. 
He's claiming to be the God of Exodus 20 where God gives the Ten Commandments and commanded that his people take a day of rest or the Sabbath. Jesus is saying, I am the Lord of Genesis 1. I am the God of the beginning. I am the God of the law, the God of the commandments. Friend, Jesus is saying, I am God. And this is why so many people at the time, they didn't, didn't want to believe it, right? The Pharisees, we learned about this last week. They said, who do you think you are? You think you're God? He says, yeah, I am. Check this out. I don't, I don't only have the power to, to heal, but I have the power to forgive sins. He says, son, friend, your, your sins are forgiven. Get up and walk because I have control over the seen and the unseen. This is it, friends. This is Jesus, the God of heaven. The last thing. First thing, Jesus was a historical figure. Jesus claimed to be God. Number three, his enemies said that he claimed to be God. Even the people who hated him said that he claimed to be God. And I just want to bring up a logical thought. The man, if, if he's a real historical figure, if he actually walked this earth, if he fulfilled those 400 prophecies, if he claimed to be God time and time again, and people who hated him said that he was God, then either he's a liar, he's a lunatic, or he's Lord. If Jesus didn't really rise from the dead, then none of this matters. A friend of Jesus rose from the dead, everything matters. If he rose from the dead, then everything matters. And we can come here and proclaim this truth that Jesus didn't just die, but he rose again, that he defeated death, that he is the king of the grave. And that is the good news that I want to share with you tonight. The man, the tomb was empty. That Jesus kicked death in the face and is alive today, my friends. 1 Corinthians 15 says that Jesus appeared to over 500 of his disciples at one time. People are going to say, oh, well, they're just all hallucinating. They're on some, some crazy drugs. It's like mass hallucinations. Any psychologist will tell you that, that a hallucination is highly individual. And you need to check this out. This is cool. Psychologists will say that hallucinations can't produce new data. They cannot produce a new thought or a new uh, piece of information. See, the Jews at the time, they didn't believe in a, in a resurrection at this time in history. They all were waiting. They were all preparing to be raised to life at the end of time. So they weren't thinking. They weren't teaching of a resurrection. It wasn't a thought to them. So if they're hallucinating, they can't come up with something that they hadn't already thought of. So the mass hallucination is out. And friend, the tomb was empty. Even critical scholars will agree on that. The tomb was empty. Either they stole it or something happened or Jesus rose from the dead, my friends. He's alive today. I want to invite the band up. We'll get into this verse and, and close and dance and hang out. But Paul says here, and this is really the heart of it, friend. This is, this is everything you need to know. And I hope that everything... I just shared makes sense. If you have more questions about it, let's talk about it. I'm a little sick, so I pray that I presented it clearly. <laughs> but God's doing something, man, and he uses imperfect people like us. Amen. Anybody thankful for that? Amazing, amazing. So Paul says here, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 6, he says, Dear friends, let me give you clearly the heart of the gospel that I've preached to you. The good news that you have heartily received and on which you stand. For it is through the revelation of the gospel that you are being saved. If you fasten your life firmly on the message I've taught you, unless you have believed in vain, for I have shared with you what I have received and what is of utmost importance. He says this, the Messiah died for our sins, fulfilling the prophecies of the scripture. He was buried in a tomb and was raised from the dead after three days as foretold in the scriptures. Then he appeared to Peter the rock and to the 12 apostles. He also appeared to more than 500 of his followers at the same time. Most of them are still alive as I write this, though a few have passed away. 
My friend, this is all you need. Here at Spectrum tonight, this is all you need to know. This is the good news. This is the good news of Jesus Christ, that the Messiah, Jesus, came to earth, that he was sent by God, that he is God. John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. The Bible says that through Jesus, all things that were made were made through him. That there was nothing that was made that wasn't made by him. That he came, that he died, and after three days, my friend, he rose again from the grave. What are you building your life on? <laughs> is it the good news? Or is it good works? Is it his good news or is it your good works? Thinking that I can just work my way to heaven. I can just do it because I'm a good person. Or because I've got money or I've got status. Man, I can just, you know, read my Bible once a week. And, you know, I cannot go to parties and not smoke or drink or talk to, to, to sketchy people. I'm not going to do anything bad and I'll be good to get to heaven. Maybe you think that. But I want to tell you, friend, that your good works will not get you to heaven. Only accepting the good news of Jesus Christ will. Believing that Jesus died on a cross for you. That he didn't just die for you, but he rose again for you. If God died for you, he's got life for you, amen? That he wants to give you potential. He wants to give you purpose and freedom and freedom from your sin and your past and your bondage and give you a life that is, that's worth living and an eternity spent with him. And I don't know what, where you've come from. I don't know your background. I don't know your story. But I'm glad you're here. And we've been praying all week for you, friend. We've been praying that you'd come, that you'd sit in these seats, that you would receive this free gift of eternal life. Jesus loves you so much that he's willing to do anything it takes to be with you. He loves you so much that he's willing to leave heaven, to come to earth and walk these dusty streets and be betrayed and be spit upon and beaten until he's unrecognizable. And he's willing to be hung up on that cross for the world to see. And he's willing to die a slow death from suffocation and heartbreak so that you could come to him. But see, the story doesn't end there. After three days, he got up out of that grave, defeating sin, defeating death, defeating brokenness and depression and anxiety. In your past, he's come to give you peace. He's come to give you life. He died for you and he rose again for you, my friend. In all four accounts of the gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in the New Testament, there's this prisoner named Barabbas. And Barabbas was this thug. He was a crook killed people. He was a rebel. And Jesus is brought before this man named Pilate. And Pilate says, hey, Jews, people, today I'll give you either Barabbas or Jesus. I'll give you a guilty man or I'll give you an innocent man, which I find nothing wrong in him. And you know what the people said? They said, give us Barabbas. They said, we, we want Barabbas. We don't want Jesus. And so the guards come and they unchain Barabbas' shackles and chains. And he walks down off that platform of free men. While Jesus, this innocent man, is taken and he's chained and he's taken away to be beaten and then eventually killed up on a cross. And you know, I bet Barabbas thought that it was the love of the people that set him free. But friend, it wasn't the love of the people that set him free. It was the love of the heavenly father that set him free. Barabbas saw, man, my, my, my people must really want me to be back with them. They must really love me. No, no, Barabbas. Jesus really loves you. 
and he wanted you to go free and he wanted to take your place so that you could live your life and that he could go and die for the sin of the world. Here's what I'm getting at. God had to treat Jesus like the sinner so that he could treat the sinner like Jesus. So that's it, friend. That's the simplicity of the message, that Jesus loves you, that he died for you, that he took your place on that cross so you didn't have to die, so that your future isn't in the ground, your future is in heaven. Because you see, apart from Jesus, our sin separates us. It's worthy of hell. It's worthy of separation, eternal punishment, eternal separation from God. But God doesn't want to be separated from you forever. So that's why he came, friend, because he loves you. And he made a way. And tonight I just want to invite you to come into the way, to accept the way. Maybe you know Jesus. Maybe you've backed away. Maybe you've been living a double life. Maybe you just need to get right with Jesus and say, God, I'm all in. Please forgive me. I turn from my past and I want to turn from you. Maybe you're here tonight and you got invited by a friend. Maybe you don't know Jesus. But maybe you want to. Maybe you don't know you want to yet. But I just pray, man, if you guys could just bow your heads, close your eyes. Just take a minute to pray for those around you. And if anyone's here tonight and you want to accept Jesus for the first time or maybe rededicate your life, I just want you to raise your hand. If you just raise your hand for me, friend, I just want to know who I'm praying for. If that's you tonight, amen, I see your hand. Yeah, hallelujah. If that's you, just raise your hand, friend. If you need to come back to Jesus, if you need to accept him for the first time as your Lord and Savior, amen. Just keep your hands raised, please. If that's you, awesome. Awesome. Well, hey, guys, we're going to close. And uh, I just want to ask you to do something pretty bold. Um, I've heard it said that if you can't stand for Jesus in a room of people that love him, then you can't stand for Jesus in a world of people that hate him. So I want to let you know that your family here, and if, if you raise your hand, can you just get up from where you're at and just come up here in the front with me? Can you guys just come up? to? Can we give them a round of applause, guys? This is why we do what we do. Just come, my friends. Come on. Awesome. Come on down. Yes. This is beautiful, my friends. If that's you, say, I need Jesus. I need a second chance. Amen. Amen. Come on. Say, I, just, I, I need my sins forgiven. I need my past covered. I accept Jesus. Come, come, my friends, if that's you. Just come on down. This is amazing. Amazing. Anybody else? Anybody else? All right, we'll give it just one more. One more sec in case you're a level 10 procrastinator. <laughs> Anybody else, friend? If you just feel that tug, you say, I need Jesus. I need to be forgiven. If that's you, just come. Receive the free gift of eternal life. Cool. Well, hey, friends, this is amazing. Can we get up for, give it up for him again? It's amazing. Believe me, I'd, I'd be screaming my head off if I could. But my voice, thank you on my behalf. Thank you. Um, but, hey, I just want to pray for you. I want to lead you in a prayer. It's not a magic spell. It's not something weird. It's just your words from your heart. Up, up to God. So if you guys wouldn't mind just praying this out loud, praying this uh, just over your life and accepting the reality of, of what you're saying, just say, Dear Jesus, I give you my life. I know that I'm a sinner. And I know that you took my place. I believe that you are the Son of God. That you came to this earth. You died on a cross for me. You didn't just die. You rose again. I turned from my past. I turned from my sin. And I turned to you, Jesus, as my Lord and Savior. <laughs> Help me to live my life all for you. In Jesus' name I pray. Everyone who agreed said, amen. amen.